What's worse than going to hell? Our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, answers that question today as the Bible bus pulls up to Psalms 82 through 84. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to join us for another great study in God's Word. So if you can, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 82 and get comfortable. And while you do that, here's a few letters from our fellow listeners. First, we've got one from Shirley in Oklahoma. While we are visiting our daughter in Alaska, we attend a local church. Last week, a woman from Iran sat beside us. I asked her what the language was that she was speaking, and she said Persian. Our communication was difficult because I do not know a word of Persian, and her English was limited. But I showed her how to access through the Bible in Persian, and she saw and heard it. I gave her a card with the website on it. I hope to see her again next Sunday, our last one in Alaska for a while, to see if she has downloaded the program. I was thrilled to be able to share like this across a great language barrier. Well, that's a great story. Thanks for being an ambassador of God's Word, Shirley. Next, we hear from Carlin in Canton, Massachusetts. I'm a truck driver who travels around the whole state Monday through Friday, 8 to 4 p.m. I consider your program my favorite and most valued resource while on the road. I've been on the Bible bus for going on five years now, and Dr. McGee has been a great influence in my life. I hope that you guys stay on the air. Your program is the best on the radio. Well, thanks, Carlin. It's a pleasure to have you join us on the Bible bus each day. Lastly, here's an email. This one's from Jennifer. She's in Tyler, Texas. I wish I could tell you how much these programs mean to me. The utter joy I felt this morning listening to Nehemiah is indescribable. Through Dr. McGee's explanations, Nehemiah has become one of my favorite books in the Bible. The more I study it, the joy of God's word becomes immeasurable. I am not an emotional person, in fact, just the opposite, but I was given to tears of joy this morning as I listened the second time to the lesson. I accepted Jesus as my Savior when I was just nine years old, but without a Christian home, I knew very little about how God works. I was blessed to be able to attend a church in my teens, and in college, I really began to love and understand God's grace and mercy. I've been listening to Dr. McGee for a long time, and my day cannot seem to get started without this wonderful teaching. I'm so grateful for the work everyone has done to continue this ministry. I'm honored to be a part of the World Prayer Team, and I love hearing the emails and testimonies from other countries as well as our own. Supporting the ministry monthly is a happiness my husband and I share together. Well, thanks for writing, Jennifer. We're grateful for the support that you and your husband do provide to keep the Bible bus going in your neighborhood and in more than 200 languages worldwide. You know, if you'd like to join Jennifer and her husband in providing a tank of gas or an oil change to keep the wheels of the Bible bus turning smoothly, call us. 1-800-65-BIBLE is the number, or you can go to our website, ttb.org forward slash give. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that's reaching millions with the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray it'll minister to each of our lives as we study it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's go to Psalm 82 through 84 as we make our way through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come here to the 82nd Psalm, and this is a psalm that very candidly has been very much misunderstood. The critic will turn to this psalm and more or less ridicule it. Those who deny the deity of Christ use this psalm. So it is important. And this is a psalm that is prophetic. It looks to the future for God's earthly people, for the nation Israel. And we see in connection with that the glory of the Lord. And it's wonderful when these are brought together. And we have here a prophetic description of the judgment which God will execute in the day when he saves the remnant. Now he begins on that note. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. That hasn't happened yet. And it will in the millennium. This looks to the future. And it says, he judgeth among the gods. Now, who is he calling gods here? It'll be important in a few moments. Verse 2, how long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Now, here is a verse of scripture that is very important to understand. 
Who is he calling gods? He's calling the judge gods. And why does he call them that? Because today they stand in his place and actually in God's shoes, if I may use that expression. And he goes on to say to them this, defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the land of the wicked. Now, here is something that is very important. When the Lord Jesus comes as the judge to this earth, He's going to defend the poor and the fatherless, the afflicted and the needy. These are the ones. Now, one of the big arguments today against capital punishment is that the rich always get off. The poor are the ones that pay the penalty. Therefore, we ought to get rid, according to that, of course, you ought to get rid of all law because the rich get off and the poor have to pay the penalty. And God is saying here to the judges, I want you to defend the poor and the fathers. This idea today that is abroad of giving the poor an opportunity is not new at all. Just as old here is the book of Psalms. And God is saying he intends to do that someday. The Lord Jesus, the Messiah, when he is reigning on this earth, will defend the poor and the fatherless, the afflicted and the needy. And today, judges are to do that because they're in God's place, and they occupy God's place. Now, he says, deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. And now we come to something that's interesting. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in the darkness. All in the foundations of the earth are out of course, and certainly today, the world is being shaken and is in great turmoil. And one of the great problems has been the judges of the earth and the judges of our land today. And so very easy for a judge to be like Pilate, wash his hands and say, well, I don't believe in that uncivilized method of punishing people by capital punishment. He can escape, you see that. Well, when anyone comes before him, he ought to remember justice is blind. And if it's a rich man that's committed a crime that deserves capital punishment, it should be executed. But unfortunately, very few of them have had to pay for their crimes. Now, will you notice, he says in verse 6, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Now, what does he mean when he says ye are gods? Now, the Lord Jesus himself, you'll recall, quoted that when they came to him and actually questioned his deity Why he answered them with this scripture here. They accused him, you remember, of blasphemy because actually he made himself God. He says, I and my father are one. And they accused him of blasphemy. And the Lord Jesus said, why, it's written in your law, year gods. And he is saying to them that they are sitting in the place of judgment. And when you sit in the place of judgment, you're taking the place of God. And so many of the saints today are guilty of that type of thing. They sit in judgment on other saints. Well, Paul, you remember, said, I'm not judged to any man. I'm going to stand before him someday. And because of that, I don't even judge myself. When you stand in the place of judgment, why, you're acting for God. And you're God's when you're judging. You've taken that position. And I'm fearful of our nation today with so many godless men that are seeking office because, to begin with, they know nothing of the background of this country. They are not in spiritual tune with the founding of this nation that was founded on the Word of God. And I remember years ago, and I was greatly impressed by that judge in New York City. Was it the Rosenthal's that were brought before him, and they were guilty of being spies? And this judge was a Jew, and he said that the night before, the next day that he handed in judgment, he spent that whole night in prayer 
I was impressed by that, my friend. Why? Well, because he was going to have to hand down a harsh judgment. He was going to have to stand actually in the place of God and take the life of a man. And a man that has that position ought to be a godly man. He ought to be a man of prayer. And I was impressed a great deal by that. I feel like today that the big problem is with the judges. Actually, not the criminal out in front. It's with the judges. And the breakdown of law and order, it's a strange place, has begun among the law profession and not really with the criminal element at all. Now, any time that you pass judgment on a person, you stand in the position of God. You know, parents ought to recognize that. What does God say to a little fella that's growing up in a home? Why, he says, little fella, I want you to listen to your mama and your papa. I want you to follow what they have to say. But wait a minute. Suppose papa and mama don't tell them the right thing and don't bring them up as they should, and they're a lot like that today. God says, I'm going to hold them responsible because they're in my place. They occupy that position because I have said to that little boy, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, forsake not the law of thy mother. And God help the father or the mother today that's not leading a child in a godly pathway. Someone said, what is worse than going to hell? And the answer that was given by a great preacher of the South years ago was to go to hell to hear the voice of a boy. And the father recognizes it and says, My son, what are you doing here? And the boy says, Dad, I followed you. May I say to you, friends, this is a tremendous verse. God says to the judges, You be sure you judge accurately. Be sure it's just. You're gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. That's what he's talking about here. Now he says, But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Now you may stand in the place of God, but you're a human being, and one day you are coming down, and you're going to have to stand before God. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. And that was a prayer, and will be a prayer of the nation Israel. I'm not sure what I could join in that prayer today. O God, judge this earth. O God, you're going to inherit all the nations. This is your and judge the earth. That is a prayer I think that any can pray today. Now, may I move on to the 83rd Psalm? And this is a song of Asaph that we have here. And this is the last of the Asaph Psalms, and it concludes this series here of these Psalms that he has written. Now, this Psalm is a rather puzzling Psalm. The fact of the matter is, You cannot fit this into the history of the nation Israel. And certainly, since you cannot, why the idea is to guess at it. And there have been some wild guesses, by the way. Let me read here. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Whoever the enemy is here, he hates God, and that would be true of any enemy. But they are marked here. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. In other words, these are some that have plotted the destruction of the nation Israel. Now, there have been those that have attempted to fit this in to the time of Jehoshaphat. And there have been others that have attempted to fit it in at other times. The important thing for us to note is that God expresses their hatred here of God. And I believe that that would be true of any enemy. Now, it says here, and they're identified now, and we begin this section here that it's difficult to fit it into history. For they've consulted together with one consent, their confederate against thee the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites, now that would be the Arabs, of Moab and the Hagarenes, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre, 
Assyria also is joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. And the children of Lot would be, of course, Moab and Edom. Now you have here these enemies. And there's no place in history where you can fit this in. And that makes this, to me, a very remarkable section and has a real meaning because it would seem to indicate that it's looking forward to the future. And apparently, these nations that were in existence at one time will probably appear again. Now, Israel in the present state is surrounded by Arab nations, and actually not all of them are Arab, that are apparently joined together, not so much as Arabs, but as those that are Muslims. They are opposed to the nation Israel. But apparently in the last days, why these nations will come back into existence, and they're not there today, and there's nothing to correspond. So I personally think that this is a very interesting passage of Scripture, and I wish I had time to deal with it farther. Now from verses 9, actually through the rest of this psalm, you have that which is an imprecatory psalm. It's asking God's judgment, and it is a retrospect of the past in this sense. He is saying, judge as you've done it in the past. It says, verse 9, do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook Kishon. Now you go back and read the story in the book of Judges of how these nations were judged at that particular time. And there are those that say, oh, God will never do that in the future. He won't. He's done it in the past, and God hasn't changed, friends. If he's done it in the past, he'll do it in the future. And I think that is the reason this is impressive. He says, just as you judged him in the past, do it in the future. And this is an imprecatory psalm. I don't think we should pray this kind of a psalm today by any means. We should, we're told to pray for enemies. Well, what should we pray? That they keep on being our enemies? No, that we pray they be converted, that they turn to God. But here, this is a call for judgment. And then he indicates here the method. Oh, my God, make them like a wheel, like the stubble before the wind. You remember that great big wheel that the oxen pulled around? It would beat out the grain, and it would really crush the stubble. And now he's saying here, Deal with them like that. And then verse 14 is the fire burneth a forest, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire. But be like a forest fire to them. This is a call for judgment, you see. And then it concludes on this note that man may know that thou, whose name alone is the Lord, art the most high over all the earth. And that name, the Lord, is Jehovah, that the world might know. And I'm convinced that the only way that this world is going to know that God is God is for him to move in judgment. The goodness of God ought to lead man to repentance, but it doesn't. It should. And if man were at all sensitive to the presence and person of God, it would lead them, but it drives them actually farther away from God and an affluent nation. When we were a frontier nation, pioneering and fighting our way across the West, we were dependent upon God. But today we don't need him. We have atom bombs. But it looks to me like right now we do need him. Now we come to the 84th Psalm, and here again the Leviticus character, this section, comes out. And this is a psalm of the sons of Korah. Now, the sons of Korah served actually in the temple, first in the tabernacle. I have a reference here of that, and I'm sure that when all of us passed over it, we paid very little attention to it. I know that when I had it here on the Through the Bible program, I merely referred to this chapter. That's First Chronicles, the 26th chapter, but now go back and look at it in the light of this psalm. Concerning the divisions of the porters of the Korahites was of Mishelemi, Ah, the son of Kori, the son of Asaph, and so on. 
Then it has this long list of that family of the Korathites. Now, Korah led the rebellion, you remember, one of them that led the rebellion against Moses, and he was judged. But now, by the grace of God, they're Levites, they're serving in the tabernacle and here in the temple of God. Now we read in verse 12, among these were the divisions of the porters, even among the chief men, having duties like one another to minister in the house of the Lord. It says they cast lot that for every man a gate. Now that means these men, strong, robust Levites, they guarded the temple. They guarded the tabernacle and then the temple at every gate. They were there to watch over it. This is a remarkable psalm. And in view of that, why we have here the temple and tabernacle called to our attention. Listen to the way it begins. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. How wonderful that this is. Listen to him now. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Is that your heart cry today? Do you love to meet with God's people? And I recognize today that in some churches you don't get much fellowship, and you get more gossip and criticism than you can get anything else. But my friend, that's the place for fellowship. And there's some wonderful churches about over this land. I hope there's one in your neighborhood where the Word of God is preached and Christ is exalted. And if it is, you ought to go there and see if there isn't a fellowship of believers there because that's where you and I are going to grow. That's where we're going to be blessed. Now, I think this is lovely. These Korahites, they saw, as they were serving in the tabernacle and temple later on, they saw this, Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself. I think they probably built nests around the temple of Solomon later on, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. And this man who wrote this psalm, as he looked up and saw that, he said, I want to dwell like that. I want to be that close to God. And he comes to verse 9. Behold, O God, our shield. Remember the Lord Jesus called attention to that. Why he says, you take that little sparrow. Why, they're not worth anything. Like you'd like to get rid of them. The way they chatter around and they mess up everything. Dirty little old bird. And the Lord Jesus said, not one of those sparrows fall, but what my father sees it. And actually, the language is stronger than that. He says, that sparrow falls in the lap of my father. Huh. Knows all about it. And so the psalmist now can say, behold, O God, our shield. You're our shield. And look upon the face of thine anointed. Now, remember, we have seen that that means the Messiah. Look upon the face of the Messiah. You see, he revealed the face of God down here. Now listen to verse 10. The sanctuary, as in the book of Leviticus, is the very center of the life of that nation. There was a day when the church was the center of social life in this country. It's not even the center of religious life today, but it ought to be. Verse 10, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand, thousand days anywhere else. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And that's what this Korath height, that's what he was, a doorkeeper. He said, I'd rather have my job than to be a rich man way off yonder somewhere. There are some people that look at their watch on Sunday morning to see if the preacher's going overtime. The psalmist here says, I'd rather spend one day in God's house than a thousand anywhere else. What a rebuke of many of us in these days. But what a glorious psalm. We'll pick right up there next time at Psalm 85. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. You know you can share today's message with a friend or family member by directing them to ttb.org. Or why don't you send them a link to our new Bible companion for Psalms. 
with a terrific synopsis of Dr. McGee's teaching and great questions to go deeper, I'll guarantee that they're going to love it. You can find it for free download at ttb.org, or you can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help. Again, that's ttb.org and 1-800-65-BIBLE. And then be sure to join us next time as our tour through the Psalms continues on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll save you a seat. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Today's study is always available, free to stream or download, thanks to the generous and faithful investments from your fellow Bible bus travelers. Just go to ttb.org or download our app to listen again anytime. As always, we'd love to know what's God teaching you.